Good evening and welcome to the Lincoln Theater. This is one of the series of our community conversations entitled The Heralds of the Harlem Renaissance. We've chose this title because we are beginning to do a lot of research and present to Columbus the significance of the Harlem Renaissance and how Columbus was really a part of that in the directions that um, the folks that were ha that was happening in New York also traveled to Detroit, also traveled to Chicago, and so the the middle station was Columbus. And so, um, some months ago or some that last year, we also had cult Columbus's cultural Harlem, where we spoke about how that uh, rolled over into our city. Um, and as we began for our, for our 2018. Um, program and project, we thought this would deem, this title would deem um, the segue into uh, that project. Um, so today we just welcome, um, I'm sorry, I'm Susan Bradford, the general manager of the Lincoln Theater. How about that? Great. Um, so today we have with me my co-chair and, and board member, um, and I'll introduce him later, um, but at this time, we'd just like to, un um, to introduce our sponsors, uh, Donna and Larry James, for uh, the Harlem Renaissance series. Um, we also have in our presence uh, local artist Percy King. And Percy King uh, does three-dimensional work of craft um, from wood that represents the icons of his generation. And I'll have him come up a little later and speak to that behalf. Um, and then we also will have, um, our mod I will serve as moderator, as is my co-chairman, uh, uh, Jack Marchbanks. Um, so at this time, I would like for uh, Caroline Bennett, and she is a graduate student up at The Ohio State University, and um, she is in the graduate program under Women's Studies and Gender, um, and is a local artist as well, transplanted from Oklahoma. Um, and so I have asked her to share some content of the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and she'll do that, and then she would also perform the first version of that. Caroline. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Lift Every Voice and Sing, what then became known as the Negro National Anthem and is also known as the Black Anthem today, was written by a man, uh, James Weldon Johnson, in collaboration with his brother, John Rosamond Johnson. Um, it was originally written as a three-poem stanza, uh, and it's now sang as a song. It was very first performed on February 12, 1900, by 500 school children in Jacksonville, Florida, in commemoration of President Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Um, the reason why I lift every voice and sing the Negro National Anthem, the Black Anthem, is so important to the Harlem Renaissance is because of everything that it symbolizes. It symbolizes the resilience within the African American community. It symbolizes the hope within the African American community. It symbolizes the uh, coming togetherness of the African American community. Um, the Harlem Renaissance, which I come to think of it as uh, both a cultural as well as a political movement, um, was not only a celebration um, for black culture and racial, racial pride, but it was also a protest against um, and a critique against um, and a disappointment in America's complacency with racism, with racism in America. And so we see this articulated through the arts. Um, prominent names that come to mind are Yazora Nair Houston, your uh, Josephine Baker, your Langston Hughes, your Louis Armstrong, and then of course James Weldon Johnson. These are all people who um, use not only their artistic abilities, but also their intellectual capacities um, to really uh, celebrate and honor of black culture and racial pride. Um, this was also a time in which um, white Americans also recognize the artistic as well as the intellectual contributions of African Americans during that time. Lift Every Voice and Sing is um, very important not only then but also today because it is a call to African Americans to stay committed to fighting for your freedom, to stay committed for fighting for your liberty, to stay committed for fighting for your humanity in a time where um, dehumanization was not only naturalized but normalized, a lift every voice and sing um, was a rallying cry 
to keep on pressing on, not only because of the healing and the hope uh, in the home that was promised to you, but because, um, really because we were all human. And so if you all would please stand with me uh, as I sing the first verse of uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Thank you, Caroline Bennett. As we begin the program, um, we're going to be talking about, of course, the heralds of the Harlem Renaissance. But it's important for us to understand where we stand um, in this generation. Um, we're talking about those, the heralds of our past generation. We have a stellar program here that's talking about our current generation. But we also have to tie in our next generation. And so from that is why I asked Percy King to come and display his artwork. Um, because two, his um, subjects and his style of, of creating, it was influenced by the 1990s, where it also was an artistic and political explosion. Um, and so for that, I'm going to have Percy just come up and share a little bit about the artwork, and then we'll move on to Jack Marchbank. Good evening. Um, so when it came to my artwork, um, what I chose is our, our subject matter that I wasn't very familiar with seeing on a, on a regular basis. Um, I told uh, Susan that I had the opportunity to visit the Louvre Museum in Paris and I'm seeing all these, you know, I'm seeing the Mona Lisa, I'm seeing Leonardo da Vinci's, I'm seeing kings and queens and I'm looking at them which, which all my life they were bigger than life images. And when you get face to face with them and you really see that these, that these individuals, these, the people in this subject matter, 
they were 24, 25 years old, 18 years old, and they simply had on their best outfits, their best dress, and um, their best jewels as well. And I looked at it and I'm saying, why not our icons? Why not I icons of the rap era? Why, 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 why am I not seeing these individuals um, um, in, in the light that I want to see them. So when you look at my pieces, and I, and I really focus in on uh, large portraits, when you look at my portraits, most of, most of the individuals in my portraits, they're not smiling. And it's not because they're looking hardcore because of you know, rap or things like that. Um, the reason for that is I want them to be also seen in the same light in these regal positions where they, where they are um, showing power and, and prominence and importance and, and authority. So when you look at my pieces, that's what you see. Um, and the pieces we chose specifically for, for this event were the Lauren Hill, which is in the back. She's a New York-based rapper. And when we talk about heralds of the Harlem Renaissance, and this is a time of cultural explosion, um, when we talk 70 years later, 80 years later, you're looking at the shrapnel from that. These, these, this, this cultural explosion is still continuing to happen. So Lauren Hill's from New York. Um, Tupac attended uh, a school, high school for art and theater in New York City as well. Uh, Bob Marley who was a champion for change. He was a Rastafari, which is directly tied to uh, Marcus Garvey and the UNIA and the Rastafari movement at the time. So that's why we chose these individuals, because they also represent the generational uh, continuance of the Harlem Renaissance. So that's my work, and I greatly appreciate it. So I encourage you to be on, be on the lookout for his work around the city. And if you are interested with him, you can talk to him following the show. So we're going to go ahead and move forward. Um, I'm going to bring Jack Marchbanks up to, give, to set the precedent of what this discussion will be about. Right after that, I will introduce the panelists. Um, and they'll each have 15 minutes each before to share their content about the Heralds of the Harlem Renaissance. And then we'll open it up to the floor for question and answer. So take your notes. And remember that we are being videotaped live. Um, and please silence your phones at this time. Jack Marchbanks. Good evening, everyone. As uh, Susan said, uh, get your notes out. This is for college credit. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, Harold, Harold means someone who is telling you something is coming. And I wanted to start out here. We have these August panelists you know, here. But I wanted to start out by framing framing uh, the whole point of a herald. We had, at the end of the 19th century, the biggest star, the biggest star of the African-American theater world was a woman. Her name was Ciceretta Jones, known as the Black Pati. And Ciceretta Jones actually became the first African-American star of the 20th century. And you talk about other aspects of the Harlem Renaissance. Why Harlem? Harlem was the local point, focal point for a lot of African Americans fleeing with the first wave of the Great Northern Migration, with vicious Jim Crow, uh, you know, even scaring people like W.E.B. Du Bois, du Bois in Harlem, with pardon me, in, in Atlanta, with so many uh, uh, lynchings occurring each day. So you had waves of African Americans moving to Harlem because there was Philip Payton an African-American realtor in 1905 uh, figured out that uh, people were afraid that the uh, subway system wasn't going get to get to Harlem, so he took advantage and he bought up a lot of properties and he created the first housing program for African-Americans in Harlem. But getting back to Black Patty, let's run that video so you can get a little bit of information on this great woman whom we all need to know more about. Hello, my name is Gino Francesconi. I'm the director of the archives in the Rose Museum at Carnegie Hall. Here's a singer, a vocalist, that's been forgotten and shouldn't be. Her name was Sissy Retta Jones, and she was known in her day as the Black Patti. That's how she was identified. And Adelina Patti, as you can see here in this program, was a, one of the great singers of her day, and she was simply known as Patti. And so, Cicereta Jones was known as the Black Patti. And now imagine, here was a woman who at her peak 
of performing had sung at the White House was making $2,000 a week. She divorced her husband and won. She sued her white manager and won. And she was singing around the world. And she was given brooches and medals made out of, of diamonds and rubies or gold. And she would wear them at every recital like a brigadier general. She would walk out in these astonishing gowns and having all of her uh, awards attached to her gown. And then her mother became ill in Providence, Rhode Island. She gave up everything to be with her mother. She had four homes around the country. And when she stopped singing, the money stopped coming in. And one by one, she had to sell her homes. And then one by one, she had to sell these phenomenal medals and brooches. And yet, uh, it wasn't enough. And by 1930, uh, she died in poverty and forgotten, and she's buried in Providence, Rhode Island. We were thrilled when we discovered that Howard University had one of only three medals that she kept for herself as souvenirs. And one of those medals is one that was given to her at Carnegie Hall. It's an extraordinary piece, and we're grateful to Howard University that they've given it to us on an extended loan where it's on view in the museum on a regular basis. Patti, she was really something, a herald, one of the heralds of the Harlem Renaissance. Another herald of the Harlem Renaissance, somebody who's actually from Ohio. Paul Lawrence Dunbar came to New York at the turn of the century to work with Will Marion Cook. And as Dr. McDaniel knows, they put this play together called Clorindy, Origin of the Cakewalk. And with that, uh, they had this hit called Who Dat Say Chicken in This Crowd, uh, which is, you know, basically you know, extolling the uh, flavorful uh, pullets that, you know, people would go crazy about back in the day. But that was Paul Lawrence Dunbar, another herald of the Harlem Renaissance. Of course, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar also passed away at early age, uh, going back to Dayton and dying of tuberculosis. Next. Next, well, there's a gentleman uh, who worked with Paul Lawrence Dunbar. His name is Will Marion Cook. Nobody sung by Bert Williams. <laughs> is Cecile McLaurin Salvant with our own Aaron Deal. I was so impressed when I saw Cecile McLaurin Salvant and Aaron Deal a couple years ago when she stepped on stage and she, this 23-year-old woman from Miami, Haitian immigrant, Haitian American, knew who Burt Williams was. So it lets you know this next generation like that young man, they're picking up on the pride and the, and the greatness of the Harlem Renaissance. Let's go to the, our next piece. Who knows about this guy, James Reese Europe, another herald actually recorded. This is his Memphis Blues. Born in Mobile, Alabama. Enlisted for World War I. He was smart enough to be promoted to lieutenant after he took a test. Took his hell fighters to Europe played jazz, and he started the Clef Club right around 1906. Will Marion Cook became a member of the Clef Club.
all these events are happening in the years running up to the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance is generally thought to have started after World War I, but all these events were building momentum in Harlem, building momentum. James Reese Europe, when he came back from World War I, marched uh, through Harlem, and unfortunately, he was killed by one of his own band members and died at a very early age. With his work, he set off the blues explosion that came along with jazz. Amy Smith, we'll be talking about her. Seems like every blues woman's last name was Smith there in the early days. All right, and you see, May 12, 1912, James Reese Europe, concert of Negro music at the Clef Club. All right, our final shot. All right, and you see, May 12, 1912, James Reese Europe, concert of Negro music at the Clef Club. All right, our final shot. Will Marion Cook, again, a great individual. Here's a tie, his tie, beyond working with Paul Lawrence Dunbar to the Harlem Renaissance. He was from Washington, D.C. He tutored Duke Ellington on piano. Duke Ellington studied under Will Marion Cook. Those are my Fab Five heralds of the Harlem Renaissance. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jack. We'll begin our panelist um, um, review here. We're going to go with ladies first. And so as I give her bio, she can prepare for her words um, to you. Dr. Valerie B. Lee, retired from The Ohio State University in June 2015 as the Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diverse Officer, as well as the Vice President for Outreach and Engagement. In June 2016, Ohio State asked her to return to chair what we what would be her third academic department. Having already chaired the Department of Studies for one term and the Department of English for two terms, she is currently the interim chair for the Department of African American and African Studies. Dr. Lee also is the recipient of two Ohio State's highest awards, the Alumni Award for the Distinguished Teaching and the Faculty Award for Distinguished University Service. She is also a past president of the National Organization, Association for Department of English, the author of three books, and a score of journal articles. She has taught a wide range of undergraduate and graduate courses in such areas as law and narrative, women's literature, African American literature, and multicultural pedagogies. I bring to you Dr. Valerie Lee. Thank you. One of my favorite courses to teach is on the Harlem Renaissance. And usually I teach it more generally as the Harlem Renaissance, but more specifically as women writers of the Harlem Renaissance. So I'm going to do in a few minutes what usually takes me 16 weeks to teach. <laughs> Langston Hughes referred to the Harlem Renaissance as the time when the Negro was in vogue. And he spoke about Harlem as a black metropolis and a black mecca. In fact, Langston Hughes said, more than London or Paris, I wanted to see Harlem, the Negro capital of the world. And every time I uh, see that statement, I remember that when I first came to, uh, went to college in Massachusetts, I had a roommate from New York. And after she asked me where I was from, I asked her where she was from, and she said, Harlem. And she said it just like she had said London or Paris. <laughs> I never forgot that. Well, the dilemma or challenge for writers during the Harlem Renaissance was, how should we represent the African American experience, not that the African American experience is monolithic, but how should we represent that experience? And one 
issue was, should we return to our African heritage? Should we simply use a classical form and then throw in it a reference to Africa? Well, the poet Conte Cullen responded by writing a poem, What is Africa to Me? And so he was rather dismissive of the African heritage and he wrote a lot of poems using classical forms like odes. He, he liked John Keats who wrote things like Ode to a Grecian Urn and so Conte Cullen wrote some odes. But what is interesting is the poems that we most remember him for today are poems that deal more with race. For instance, he has a poem once when I went to Baltimore when I was just eight years old. He writes how he was called the N-word for the first time. And it's a very short poem, but it's a very powerful poem. And he's also known for a sonnet called Yet Do I Marvel. And in this particular sonnet, what he's writing about is how there are so many things that are really puzzling to him. I doubt not God is good and well-meaning and kind. And then he goes on to uh, list all of these things that are puzzling. The final couplet says this, yet do I marvel at this curious thing to make a poet black and bid him sing. So that gets at the dilemma that a lot of the writers felt. What should we write about as African American poets? Another theme that a, a number of the writers wrote about was the working class. And a person who was famous for writing about the working class was Langston Hughes, who used the rhythm and style of the blues. He created characters such as Jesse B. Semple and Alberta K. Johnson, and these were gritty, savvy folks, full of folk humor and wisdom. Semple would say things like, I may not have much education, but, and then after he said that, he would have all of these philosophies behind uh, that statement. Or he would say he was very proud of his blackness and he would say things such as, be your own working class black self. If you are cornbread, don't try to be angel food cake. <laughs> so Hughes also had poems that were called the Madam Poems and these were poems by African American women describing their lives. They were usually overworked domestics who complained about how the white women they worked for claimed to love them so much but were working them as if they were pack horses. Or there's one poem that I like when you hear this woman, Madam, talking to the phone company. It's called Hello Central because that's how you address the phone company back in the day, I'm told. <laughs> um, and so she has found out that she has been charged for a collect call, and so she tells the operator, I don't know why Roscoe, that's her boyfriend, would do that. Roscoe knows long distance ain't free. And so the operator stops her and says, we don't hear about your private business. We don't want all of that. Just pay us. And so Madam, who's sassy, says, well, if you don't want to hear about my business, I don't want to hear about yours, and she hangs the phone down. <laughs> So in general, what Hughes was trying to do with the working class is to give us these people who were really resilient. And one of his short poems says that. It's called Still Here. I've been scar scarred and battered, my hopes, this wind unscattered. Snow has frizzed me, sun has baked me. Looks like between them they done tried to make me stop laughing, stop loving, stop living, but I don't care. I'm still here. That kind of resiliency. Most people know Langston Hughes for other poems. The one that he has that resonates with the Conte Cullen poem about going to Baltimore and being called the N-word is Langston Hughes has this one poem called Merry Go Round, and it's about this little southern boy who goes to the north for the first time, and he's so used to Jim Crow segregation that when he sees the merry-go-round, his question to the conductor is, well, where's the horse for a boy who's black? 
because he knows that he's supposed to go to the back. But if you see a merry-go-round, where's the back? So it's, um, it's a very powerful poem, as well as other poems you probably know by Langston Hughes, Mother to Son, and uh, I Too Sing America, and many, many others that if we had time, I would just love to recite, but I won't. Um, the Harlem Renaissance writers also wrote about race in America. Claude McKay has a sonnet, If We Must Die, and it was written in response to all the hate crime that was going on, especially during the summer of 1919. And it was called the Red Summer for all the blood that was flowing. And what's so interesting about that poem as a sonnet, since it is talking about fighting, is that usually when we think about the sonnet, we think about love. So you have Shakespeare writing all of these sonnets, let me not to the marriage of true minds amid impediments, love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or these love poems by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, how do I love thee, let me count the ways, I love thee to the height and death and breath my soul can reach, on and on. But what Claude McKay did was he wrote a poem that was really about fighting and fighting back, that when you face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. So that the subject of this sonnet seems to burst through the seams of this classical form. Another theme is with the Southern black heritage, and here we think in terms of people like Zora Neale Hurston, who like to write about characters who are playing the dozens, who are signifying, sharing folk beliefs and stories. Her characters reside on places like the Everglades and uh, the Muck, Eatonville, Florida. So her well-known book is Their Eyes Were Watching God, and actually it is one of the most taught books in uh, classes of uh, 20th century American literature. And it's about a woman's search for her authentic and her authentic self and real love. Janie, the protagonist, tells, shares her story with her friend uh, Phoebe. And it is a story where race and sexuality are inextricably linked. Hurston was the only writer writing about the, the Southern black heritage. Also, you have Gene Toomer and his book, Cain, where he writes about these women who are as perfect as dusk when the sun goes down. His characters seem to lose something when they go north. But the um, major and the final theme that I really want to talk about that you find in so many of the fictional works is the theme of passing. Maybe in the Q&A, you will ask me about one of the most interesting historical cases of that period uh, of a woman who passed, the daughter of a really well-known African-American state senator. But let me just deal with it in fiction now. One of the early passing stories is James Weldon Johnson's The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. And yes, this is the James Weldon Johnson who co-wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing. He did not pass. Mm -hmm. So it's a fictional work that he wrote. And it's about this man who passes and at the end of his life when he's married to a white woman that he has told about his black blood she takes it really hard at first, but she gets over it. She's pretty nice, and they, uh, she gives birth to two children. She dies when the second one is born. Uh, the narrator never tells these children that he's really black, and at the end of this story, there's a lot of regret and remorse because he feels that he has sold his birthright for a mess of pottage, and I, I think you catch that biblical allusion there. He feels that his whole life has been a moral failure because he has failed to live it as a black man. The, one of the best works on passing, you know, where you have uh, a black person waking up one day and saying, I no longer choose to live as a black person for various reasons. I will now live as a white person. And a lot of this was going on during the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, but one of the best works is Nella Lawson's Passing, where she complicates the tragic mulatto character 
the character's name is Claire, and Claire loves taking this risk of passing. In fact, she's, she marries a white supremacist. And you know, you have to be really uh, risky to do a move like that. And this story has a homoerotic subplot where there's race and sexuality on link. There's another book by Jesse Fawcett, Plum Bun. Once again, you have a daughter who's fair skinned, she passes. Her sister's darker, can't pass. Her father's darker, he can't pass. And as you can imagine, some disastrous things happen. Some of you might have seen the film Imitation of Life. And, and so, you know, these stories tend not to end well. But um, what they were doing during the Harlem Renaissance was given a major challenge to the African-American caste system. Some call this colorism. And they were trying to defend a black beauty aesthetic. And I just want to share this one quote from Zora Neale Hurston to give you an idea of what they were trying to protest. Hurston says this in her autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road. I found the Negro, and always the blackest Negro, being made the butt of all jokes, particularly black women. They brought bad luck for a week if they came to your house on a Monday morning. They were evil. They slept with their fists balled up, ready to fight and squabble, even while they were asleep. They even had evil dreams. White, yellow, and brown girls dreamed about roses and perfume and kisses. Black gals dreamed about guns, razors, ice picks, hatchets, and hot lie. I heard men swear they had seen women dreaming and knew these things to be true. So you had that kind of ideology going on, such that at the end of the Harlem Renaissance, when Wallace Thurman wrote his book, The Black of the Berry, he has a dark-skinned black protagonist, and she eats lye and arsenic wafers and uses bleaching creams so that she can one day join a Blue Veins Club. It never happens. But uh, she's up against African-American folklore that says things such as, a yellow gal rides in a limousine, a brown gal rides in a Ford, a black gal rides on an old jackass, but she gets there, yes, my lord. So then, in my own research, to conclude, what I do, in, in one of my books, I, I write how people like Gwendolyn Brooks and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and Ntozaki Shange and Audre Lorde and Gloria Nail and Lucille Clifton actively and vigorously challenge a white beauty aesthetic. They say in their works, no, we don't want blue eyes. No, we will not place a clothespin on our noses at night to make our noses straighter. No, our wild, aggressive hair does not need to be jailed. Yes, nappy hair has the ability to jump up and dance. Yes, our hips are big hips. They need space to move around in. They don't fit into little petty places. These hips have never been enslaved. So this reclaiming of the black beauty aesthetic. So there are many themes from the Harlem Renaissance that are still with us today. And is, in his poem, Harlem, Langston Hughes poses a question that continues to reverberate throughout African-American history and cultural productions. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or does it explode? Harlem as a city and the Harlem Renaissance as a movement captured dreams and released anxieties. Like the blues and African American life, the Harlem Renaissance was bittersweet. Thank you, thank you. Lots of great information, lots of great information. We're gonna bring forward now uh, Dr. Ted McDaniel and he will be followed by Will Haygood. And if you give me a minute, I can condense all of his work into uh, this bio. Dr. Ted McDaniel, professor of African American music at The Ohio State University since 1981, is a specialist in jazz history, jazz performance, and African American music, who retired from OSU after teaching there for 35 years on June the 1st, 2015. 
He held faculty appointments in the School of Music and Department of African American and African Studies, where he served as the department chair for eight years. His scholarly and creative writings were mostly um, on aspect as jazz and black music, and he was also invited to lecture extensively throughout the United States and to the present in Africa, Europe, and China. He was doc director of jazz studies and director of OSU Jazz Ensemble from 1990 to 2015, and his leadership of the OSU's Jazz Ensemble led to performances throughout Ohio and the United States. They also looked, they also looked also took five international tours uh, in Europe uh, through 1996 to 2007, and France, Switzerland, Australia, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands, where they performed as the lead jazz festivals in Canada in 1986 and Seattle, Vancouver, British Columbia. But most recently, in 2014, uh, to China in the United States Department, sponsored by a tour with performances in Beijing. Um, also in Wahoon and Shanghai through the Center of African Culture. Additionally, he led the administrative team for the o annual OSU Jazz Festival, the annual OSU Summer Jazz Camp, and also the occasional jazz symposium. His numerous music arrangements represents a diverse portfolio, but primarily for jazz bands, R&B groups, and marching bands. He has written for the Sesame Street t TV show, and has served as the arranger for the OSU marching band since 1998, 91. I'm sorry, 1981, where he is, where his music has been performed by the Big Ten Stadium and major bowl games. In the autumn of 2013, his musical arrangements of Michael Jackson's halftime show for the OSU marching band was viewed by 15 million people on YouTube. He was written, he has written music for halftime presentations in the Rose Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, the Orange Bowl, and the National Champion Bowl sites. Among his many awards is the recognition for his contributions in the field of music. He was the recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award in 1987 and the Distinguished Scholar Award in 1994 from the Ohio School, from the Ohio State School of Music. In 2000, he received the Distinguished Diverse, Diversity Enhancement Award and the Faculty Award for a Distinguished University Service in 2011 from The Ohio State University. In closing of this bio, <laughs> in 2006, he's done a lot of work, so we want to make sure that you know that um, because it is, um, um, it is uh, uh, impacting. In 2006, the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity commissioned him to write new works of music in the commemoration of their centennial celebration in Washington, D.C., and in 2011, he served as the music conductor, the music arranger for the dedication of the Martin Luther King Jr. Mon Mon Monument on the Mall in Washington, D.C. Um, for the Constitutional Hall concert. He has also served as music consultant for the film on the MLK monument entitled Building the Dream. The debut um, was on public TV te television stations in the summer of 2013. He is a music scholar of blues and jazz and a consultant for the new African American Museum built in Nashville, Tennessee. And I do believe that's your hometown, Memphis, Memphis Tennessee. Okay. And his BA is, degree is in from Morehouse University. His MA and his doctorate degrees are from the University of Iowa. A native of Memphis, Tennessee, he previously taught at Morehouse College and North Carolina A&T State University. He continues to be a scholar, a teacher, a ranger, conductor, clinician, and adjudica adjudicator for the African American Music and Jazz Education Circles, Dr. Ted McDaniel. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let me say I'm honored to uh, be sitting on this stage with uh, this young lady and these gentlemen, these young ladies. Um, when I first heard about the uh, Harlem Renaissance when I was a youngster growing up in Memphis, I was taught that it was a uh, 
literary movement. And for, I think, a few years, I assumed that that's what it was, but I was always uncomfortable with that. And I learned more when I realized that so many of the literary figures were writing about music and the impact of music. And I think about today, uh, in the last 10 years especially, there are so many hip hop scholars. Uh, and sometimes I think the hip hop scholars forget that it's, it's the rap music that's the driving engine of hip hop. Um, so I'm happy that uh, when we talk about the Harlem Renaissance now, we uh, make music a central aspect because indeed it was. You can't go to Harlem, even right today, and not hear some music blaring out of somebody's car window or somebody's apartment. The fact of the matter is, is that music drives black culture. Uh, and if it doesn't move you older folks, just watch what your youngsters do, because they're all into it. I say that as a kind of um, opening to, um, there's so much music during the Harlem Renaissance, I'm going to have to limit it to three or four things. First, I want to talk about the piano tradition of ragtime. You know, ragtime is this syncopated music in its heyday in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, James Scott, uh, Thomas Turpin, Scott Joplin becomes the king of ragtime. His uh, Maple Leaf Rag was published in 1899. Now what's important about this, that's, that's pre-Harlem Renaissance, but what is important about that is that it is the piano tradition that more than any other aspect of the music that defined the band tradition that would come about in the next couple of decades. You had, after Joplin, the most important figure, keyboard figure, was a man by the name of James P. Johnson. James P. Johnson, uh, in 1921, recorded a composition called Carolina Shout. I'm sorry we can't hear just a few seconds of that. If we heard it, let me tell you what you would hear you would hear the infusion of the blues into essentially a ragtime musical format where you could still hear organically underneath ragtime, but those jagged rhythms have been more relaxed. And what's really happening right before our very eyes and ears in 1921 was this element of swing that J.P. Johnson is largely responsible for. What's important about J.P. Johnson is that virtually every significant pianist after that followed him, including Duke Ellington, uh, who found it necessary to memorize the 1921 recording of James P. Johnson. Count Basie, who created his great orchestra, is a stride pianist by definition and by nature coming out of the James P. Johnson tree. You know more people like Fats Waller, Willie the Lion Smith, and eventually Toledo native Art Tatum, who took it to such an incredible height. But all of these stem from the tree of James P. Johnson. So I want to mention that name first. Now, the thing about ragtime is jagged. You take um, Maple Leaf Rag. Okay. You go back to 1889 when that uh, was first published. You actually hear Joplin because he's playing on a piano roll. Thank goodness that we actually are able to hear that. But I could play for you the 1938 recording of the same tune by Jelly Roll Morton, and you'll hear do de do de do do de boo do li do de boo la. Now Duke Ellington was doing the same thing, but he took it 
to another level. Essentially, what Duke did was to take these lines and orchestrate them for wind instruments. Duke was a pianist. He moved to Harlem after he left his hometown of Washington, D.C., leading a band called the Washingtonians. Eventually moves to New York. He is stimulated. You can't help. If you have ears and you're into music, you are going to be stimulated by the sounds that you hear. And that's what happened to Duke Ellington. So what Duke started to do was literally to take his pen and orchestrate those sounds. So you listen to Maple Leaf again, and, and I'm sorry we can't play that in Carolina Shout, so you could hear. Duke would take, boo pa boo da boo pa boo do da chop chop boo choo cha choo cha choo pa pa boo da this blues infusion of this ragtime. Ellington played ragtime. You listen to early rag, uh, early Ellington, you hear ragtime. But with the infusion of the blues, those beats got relaxed, and there was a buoyancy rhythmically that we think of as being hip right now. We call it swing. And that's what happened during that period. Duke Ellington, of course, uh, was the greatest composer on American soil. And throughout, throughout the 1920s and 30s, up until the time of his death, he demonstrated his love, his profound love and respect for this music, uh, this big band music called jazz. I took a few titles uh, from his uh, very impressive uh, uh, canon. Chocolate Kitties, you know, these are expressions of pride, blackness in Harlem. The Blues I Love to Sing, 1927. Black and Tan Fantasy, 27. Black Cat Blues, 27. Immigration Blues. Boy, couldn't we play that for Trump right now? <laughs> I'd love to do that. Creole Love Call, 28. Black Beauty, 28. Harlem Flat Blues. The Blues with a feeling. Rent Party Blues, you know, with John... Uh, with Johnny Hodges, you know the story about rent parties. It was an opportunity to help out economically. People struggling, finding a way. When you struggle, you improvise. That's what jazz is all about. It's all about improvisation. I dare you. And you make it happen. You find a way. You create a way. And that's what Ellington did. He was a master at improvisation. And the other thing that made him so profound, and this happened, he was fully developed during the Harlem Renaissance. What he did in the 40s and 50s was to simply continue to make those signature songs. You know them. Uh, Satin Doll, Take the A Train. Take the A Train is all about Harlem. If you go to New York, you're going down 8th Avenue line, you're going to take the A Train. That's the, that's the quickest way to get to Harlem, as a matter of fact, if, you, if you're coming from uh, 45th Street or 42nd Street. So Duke did all of these jungle nights in Harlem, dropped me off in Harlem. Sophisticated Lady was in 1933. If it don't mean a thing, it ain't got that swing. It was 1932. Mood Indigo, Jungle Nights in Harlem, Blue Fielding, Harlem Speaks, on the Sun and on the Mood, Hyde Park, Echoes of Harlem, Black Butterfly, Downtown uproar, riding on the blue note, empty ballroom blues. I should say something about dancing. How am I doing time-wise? Because I'm not even looking at my watch. I got seven minutes? Okay. Thank you. Let me say something about ballroom because this is important. Duke Ellington was at the uh, uh, cotton, what, what is it? Cotton Club. Thank you. It was at the Cotton Club. He went there in 1927. And, and what's important about the Cotton Club? First of all, you know, it was run by mobsters and gangsters. The entertainment was all black. They had these gorgeous, these gorgeous black women. Um, they provided the entertainment. What's important to know about his tenure there? And I, I used to always wonder why did Duke Ellington make his investment in composition as opposed to arranging? And it came out 
the reason he is one of the greatest composers of all time is because the constantly changing stage shows at the Cotton Club, I think it was there for seven years, required him to create new music as opposed to simply arranging music that already existed. And that's what he did. He continued to put out new pieces of music um, and, and, and that contributed to uh, Duke Ellington. The other great thing about Duke, who wore three hats, um, you know him as the composer, he was a very fine pianist. Listen to early Duke Ellington, you hear that stride piano, you hear the ragtime organically underneath that, you hear that. Listen to recordings of the early Ellington Orchestra, you hear those jagged syncopated rhythms that made you want to get up and dance. And of course, Duke, like most of the bands, play uh, those ballrooms, uh, of which I think the most important one for the period that we're talking about was the Savoy Ballroom. The Savoy Ballroom was nicknamed the home of Happy Feet because at one end they had a stage with a bandstand, and the other end they had a stage with a bandstand. So as soon as this band finished this set, you didn't have time to go sit down and take a breath. The other band would strike right up. And it was all about dancing. You know, we always dance. Dance is improvisation. That's why you love it. You think you're not creative? You are creative. I watch you on the dance floor. You're moving all kinds of ways. That's why Duke captured that. And in his choice of personnel, whether it was Harry Carney on baritone sax, who was with him for over 40 years, same thing with Johnny Hodges, the word in the Duke Ellington band was that if you were a member of the band, you were married to the band because they lasted many times for a career. He was a band leader. That's the third hat he wore. He was the composer. He was the jazz pianist. And he was a band leader. It's hard to be a band leader. It's hard to be a band leader because you got to deal with egos every day and night. You got to pay people every day and night. You're looking for gigs. You got to keep them working every day and night. But Duke was successful. He went beyond. You know, that's why when there are a lot of writers talking about Duke, they say, you know, he's beyond category. You know, that's how great he is. Now, there's one other person that I want to just say something about. Because if at gunpoint in the alley out here, I had to name the single most important person in the world of jazz, I'd have to say Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong gave jazz its vocabulary. You cannot talk unless you have a vocabulary. Doesn't matter how limited it is, but you've got to be able to say something with some meaning in order to communicate. And that's what Louis Armstrong did. Oh, my goodness. He was in New York with the Fletcher Henderson Band in the late 1920s. They couldn't believe they couldn't believe what they were hearing. Uh, two important recordings from that period. You want to think about uh, rapping it and stampede. The improvisation, the solo ideas, the creativity, that's the DNA of this expressive music that we have, that we are loved and revered all around the globe because of what we say or how we communicate with sound. And Louis Armstrong was a master at that. And there's not a trumpet player, even piano players. You listen to Earl Hines. You listen to Teddy Wilson. You listen to Jelly Roll Morton. And they all talk about how they all got influenced by Louis Armstrong by the way he played his trumpet. Now, in closing, let me say there's another tradition that is significant, uh, just as important, and that is the tradition of the blues. And in the 1920s, you had a group of women, the classic blues singers. The empress, of course, was Bessie Smith, but she wasn't the only one. 
That was Mamie Smith. You talk about the Smiths. Uh, that was Mamie Smith. That was Lee and Glenn. That was Alberta Hunter. Uh, all of these women recording these race records helped to define the African-American popular music tradition that we now know. So the 1920s and 1930s uh, for this period that we call the Harlem Renaissance, pregnant with so much music, so much music, so much creativity, new sounds. What's, what blows my mind about it when I really sit down and think about it is that they didn't create a new instrument. They took the same old instruments that have, listed, uh, that have existed for years. But it's what you do with it. It's the fertilizer you put on that lawn that makes it grow <laughs> beautifully. And that's what they did, and they did it through their creative ideas. So thank goodness for Langston Hughes. Uh, you need to look at his uh, uh, racial mountain uh, statement. Uh, I'm just, boy, I remember reading this. I love it. Let me just, just read just a little bit of it right quick. So I'm ashamed for the black poet who says, quote, I want to be a poet, not a Negro poet, end of quote, as though his own racial world were not as interesting as any other world. I'm ashamed, too, for the colored artist who runs from the painting of Negro faces to the painting of sunsets after the manner of the academicians because he fears the strange unwhiteness of his own features. An artist must be free to choose what he does, certainly, but he must also never be afraid to do what he might choose. Let the blare of Negro jazz bands and the bellowing voice of Bessie Smith singing blues penetrate the closed ears of the colored near intellectual until they listen and perhaps understand. Let Paul Robeson singing Water Boy and Rudolph Fisher writing about the streets of Harlem and Gene Toomey holding the heart of Georgia in his hands and Aaron Douglas drawing strange black fantasies cause the smug Negro middle class to turn from that white, respectable, ordinary books and papers to catch a glimmer of their own beauty. We young and Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark-skinned selves without fear or shame. The white people, please, we are glad. If they are not, it doesn't matter. We know we are beautiful and ugly, too. The tom-tom cries and the tom-tom laughs. If colored people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, their displeasure doesn't matter either. We build our temples for tomorrow, strong as we know how, and we stand on top of the mountain, free within ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ted McDaniel, on that. So we've covered music and women in the Harlem Renaissance. And um, as we were putting, to, putting this together, um, our wonderful Columbus native, Will Haygood, um, said that he would be in town and that he wanted to share uh, some of his pieces and his knowledge and his ideals about the Harlem Renaissance as well. So we're really happy to have him here uh, on the panel. Um, Will is the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship Award along with the Patrick Henry uh, White um, Fellowship Award. And most notably, he's been penned um, several um, by autobiographies, uh, Two on a River in 1986, King of the Cats with Adam Clayton Powell in 93. Um, he also wrote his uh, own biography of the Haygoods of Columbus in 97. Um, he also did Black and White, The Life of Sammy Davis Jr. in 2003, uh, Sweet, Sweet Thunder, The Life and Times of Sugar Ray Robinson in 2009, that we did the book signing here, right here in this room. Um, of course, The Butler, The Witness of History in 2013, um, and Showdown, um, that was the third good marshal in the Supreme Court nomination that changed America um, that he produced in 2014. He's been um, awarded many um, awards for the showdown uh, through the Scribes Book Award, the Ohioan, uh, Ohio Anna Library Award, also the BCALA Honorary Literary Award, um, and then also the Olander Justice Award uh, that was given in DC for Philanthropic Foundation honoring uh, public figures and ordinary citizens who do extraordinary work and contributions to the to the, to the society. Um, so for that, I wanted to uh, just share with him um, and bring him to uh, the mic and uh, welcome Will Haygood. <clears throat> I 
And since nobody else was going to use this, I was going to make Jack feel good that it was of use because I know he's been, he's been sitting there looking at it. Uh, so I grabbed it out. Um, I just flew in today a couple hours ago. And every time I fly into town, uh, I start riding around and I pretend that I'm lost. And I say, how can you find yourself and redirect yourself? And then I think, oh, why, not, why don't I go over to Will Haygood Way, which is the street right out front, and then I can get my bearings. And so that's what I did. So I humbly welcome you this evening to Will Haygood Way. Uh, um, one of the biggest honors of my life. Um, my comments are going to be brief because we have run over time already, and I want to actually hear your questions. So years ago, I left this town on the Greyhound bus, and I went to New York City. And I got a job at Macy's department store. I went through the vaunted executive, executive training program at Macy's. I was a low-level assistant manager in the sheets and towels department. <laughs> I was the guy you came to when you wanted to know about the white sale <laughs> and about the Stevens towels. My mother was telling people that my baby's running Macy's. <laughs> I loved the job. I walked down Madison Avenue every day in a suit and tie. It lasted for a year and four months, and then I was fired. I simply was not very good at the job. So I came back home here, and I had to reorient myself and find a career. In college at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, Marion Musgrave, she was the only African-American member of the English faculty in the 1970s at Miami University. She introduced me to James Baldwin and Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and all the writers of the Harlem Renaissance. At Miami, I always got good grades in English literature, A's and B's. They were the perfect balance to the C's and D's that I would get in microbiology. <laughs> they would always be balanced out. So after being fired, I had to anchor myself to something, and I said to myself, I like writing. So I started writing newspaper editors around the country, and I got a job in Charleston, West Virginia, and then I got a job in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then I got a job at my dream paper, and that was the Boston Globe. It was a writer's paper. Shortly after arriving at the Boston Globe, there was this buzz going on about Harlem, about a rejuvenation, a renewed interest in the giants of Harlem. And I walked over to the national editor at the Boston Globe and said, hey, can I go to Harlem? and do a two-part series on the writers and the artists who made up the Harlem Renaissance. And this was in the 80s. And so there were quite a few of them still living. And I went to Harlem, and I spent two weeks 
walking around, interviewing people. Arthur P. Davis, who was a great Harlem poet. All these people who knew Langston Hughes. These dancers who had danced in the 20s at the Apollo Theater. And I wrote this big series. It was, it was going to be two parts, but it turned into three parts. And it really was sort of my coming out as a national writer at the Boston Globe. And then one day I came to work and my editor said, there's a writer up in Amherst, Massachusetts. He's a visiting writer on the college campus there, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And I'd like you to go up and interview the writer. And I said, great, who is it? And he said, James Baldwin. <laughs> and I froze. <laughs> like being sent to meet the James Baldwin and you know that the whole newsroom is going to be like wondering and what you're going to come back with. James Baldwin, who was physically, spiritually touched by the Harlem Renaissance. So I got a rental car and I drove up to Amherst and he was staying with a family in this converted barn and I was sitting in the living room waiting on the James Baldwin to come down the steps. And he did. He was real quick, light of feet. He was smoking a cigarette. And he looked at me and he said, hey, how you doing, baby? <laughs> and I shook his hand and I was awed. He had a book that had just come out. And I asked him all of these questions. And then I felt I had enough for my story. I had already started dreaming of writing books. It was just a deep dream of mine. And I wondered if it was possible. And I got the nerve before I left, I said, Mr. Baldwin, and can I ask you a question that doesn't have anything to do with this story? And he said, sure, baby. <laughs> and I said, I want to know if someday I'll be able to write books. And he looked at me very quizzically, and he said, I have no idea. <laughs> And that hurt me because I wanted him to say something like, yeah, of course, you know, something to lift me up, you know, something to put wings on my arms. But he looked at me after that and he said, and but I'll tell you this, you got to go the way your blood beats. You got to go the way your blood beats. Out of that grew a biography I wrote on Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Out of that grew a biography I wrote on Sugar Ray Robinson. Out of that grew a biography I wrote on Sammy Davis Jr. Out of that grew a biography I wrote on Thurgood Marshall. All Harlem set figures because if you look at them and use them as the spokes wheel in the biographical art you tell two histories you tell the history of black America and the history of white America you do it's a double charge that I've given myself through my work. For the past year, 
It's been a joy of mine to travel the country and pick out artwork for the Columbus Museum of Art in the I2 Sing America 100 year anniversary Harlem exhibit that's going to open next fall. I thank Larry James for coming up with the idea and Nanette Macy Junes for wrapping her arms around it, Sarah Rogers for wrapping her arms around it, because really it's just been a writer finding the mission statement that James Baldwin, who was touched by Harlem, gave him. And it's been a joy. And I'll see you, if not sooner, I'll certainly see you in October of 2018. God bless you. All right. Thank you. Will Haygood. A round of applause for all of our panelists. Dr. Ted McDaniel. Dr. Valerie Lee. Mr. Will Haygood. Outstanding. I tell you, that's, that's worth, worth, worth more than just a few credit hours. That's, that's a degree right there. Two years. Uh, like to open it up for questions. You have some really august people with a lot to share with you. So let's have a few people come up and ask some questions. Let's come to the front. I see. This has been a beautiful experience for me. And I could come back. I'm looking forward to actually getting a copy of the tape so I can listen to it again. But he, here's the question I want to ask. My wife and I had the good fortune of having a daughter. She just moved to Harlem, and she lives in what I'm told is a historically famous building called Lenox Terrace. Yeah. And wondered if you had any stories or insight you could share with everybody here about Lenox Terrace. First of all, let me say this. Um, in the book I'm writing, uh, it's about East High School, 1968-69, and the two state championships that they won. Uh, it's a book that I've been at work on and it's going to be out uh, next fall. And Mr. Willis, your father makes uh, uh, a beautiful appearance in this book. And so I just wanted you to know that. Um, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, Lennox Terrace, uh, yes, and some great people lived in that building. Um, uh, writers lived in that building. Uh, I think uh, Walter White of the NAACP lived in that building. Um, it was um, near this area of Harlem known as Strivers Row, you know, named, you know, just for the simple fact that all the people were thought to be wonderful strivers, striving up. Uh, and who knows why? And the building became so famous. But you know, if you lived there and you had a name, uh, you would recommend other people in your class of people, you know, like singers or other writers or other poets, uh, you know, and they would want to live in that building. Uh, I've been by it several times. Uh, my first visit uh, there was to visit Charlie Rangel. Uh, who was the congressman uh, who replaced Powell, and so uh, and I think he still lives there, uh, and so it is just a great Harlem address. Please, David, I want to mention working on a project that will tie some things on online with the connection between the Harlem Renaissance and Columbus during the time it launches next year. Uh, Dr. Lee, there was there were things that you mentioned about some of the different writers. And uh, there was a letter that I don't know if my memory is right. Um, uh, David Lever and Lewis wrote a long set of biographies about W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, my memory is that Du Bois tried to marry his daughter off to County Cullen. The, mar the marriage bed did not go well. Um, and that it was soon after that that the crisis started saying, nope, you have to do propaganda now, every time. And then the... Lanks and Hughes wrote a letter saying, well, yeah, this is what we do, this is what we are, but we have to be artists first. And 
I remember hearing you say something about how you cannot deny your blackness if you're an artist, but you can't deny your artistry if you're black. So I wasn't really sure. Is my memory wrong? There was a big controversy yeah. during the Harlem Renaissance in, in terms of whether there is any such thing as black art. Okay, right. So you have people like George Scholar saying that there isn't anything such as black art, that any people who are economically depressed, um, any people who have a struggle are likely to write certain forms. But it's then you totally had this other school, ignorant. Langston Hughes, who said, this is nonsense. And I, I think you heard the um, passage that Professor McDaniel read. So, but uh, there has always been this debate in a, a lot of literary circles. Uh, and it, it goes back really far. It goes back as far as someone like Aristotle who raised the question, who is it who can write the best poem about the sea? Is it a sailor because the sailor knows something about the sea or is it the poet who knows something about poetry? So you get caught up in that kind of um, debate. Is there a, such a thing as African American literature? And for generations, a lot of people said no. In fact, even those of us in departments of English for the longest when they didn't teach uh, African-American uh, literature because this idea was that there's American literature. So when people raised their hand and said, well, no, um, what we are calling American literature has often just been white uh, literature, but whiteness never has to bear its name. It's an unmarked right. center. And so there is such a thing as African American literature, and there are some features that you can identify, just like in the music, when you can identify certain um, features. So yes, there was that quarrel going on between uh, Langston Hughes and uh, some of the other uh, writers. Um, some and, and Conte Cullen was trying to walk that uh, thin line because he was much more conservative than what Langston Hughes was in terms of what counts as good literature. Larry Jean, chair of the board here. Um, Dr. Lee, the poem, If We Must Die, Yes. the popularity of that was not one of a struggle or a black writer. Mm -hmm or yes. a black person. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to answer that question and then for the yes. panel to talk about that kind of evolution and the influence and mm -hmm. the importance of the Renaissance on all of America. Okay, well, here's, here's one thing about that poem, if, if We Must Die by Claude McKay, because Claude McKay, uh, of course, was uh, uh, a black poet, and I think his origins from Jamaica and all, but he wrote the poem and, and then the poem didn't have that much popularity until Winston Churchill came along and he used that poem to inspire the Allied forces because, you know, it, it, it says, uh, you know, keep fighting and um, don't turn your back. Uh, it has this kind of inspirational tone to it. So Churchill used it, and many people didn't even associate it with uh, what had happened to the blacks who had been lynched and all at the uh, turn of the century because Winston Churchill was using it to um, juvenize his, um, his, his soldiers. And then to make it even more of an interesting history, one day a reporter, a journalist, was at the Attica prison riots, and some of you may remember that, and they saw on the outside of one of these uh, bars, one of the prison cells, this poem, If We Must Die. The reporter mistakenly thought that the prisoner had written it. And so the reporter wrote this little thing in uh, one of the news magazines about, oh, look at there. You think this prisoner is illiterate and can't write? And look at this. This poem has some value to it. And it took a, an African-American writer, I think it was Gwendolyn Brooks, who wrote in and said, are you kidding? You should know. <laughs> this is a famous poem. This is a poem by Claude McKay, if, if We Must Die. So the poem has gone through different cycles because Pieces of literature that are well done do get recycled 
and, and they have a, um, they can make a history of their own. And, and this is one of the very interesting uh, poems. So in a very traditional form, the sonnet, written by uh, a black author, falls out of popularity, resurrected by uh, a, a major historical fi figure, Winston Churchill, falls out of popularity again, and then is found at the Attica prison riots, and, and now it's any book that is an anthology of um, African-American literature of black uh, poetry will have that particular poem in it. What is fascinating? Uh, what is really fascinating to me is that, you know, before the Harlem Renaissance, there was no army of black writers who had been known and who had forged national reputations. This really was the coming out artistic literary movement in this country. Also, every Every black writer, artist during the Harlem Renaissance um, had their back up against the wall. Um, one of the patron saints of that movement was Alfred Knopf and Blanche Knopf. They published uh, the first writers during the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, I am with the Knopf Company in New York, and my editor, Peter Gethers, um, is right in tune, right in rhythm uh, with the work that I do. Uh, but it, it almost was a death struggle for these artists to get their work published or their work seen or magazines published. There were so many magazines that were born during the Harlem Renaissance and folded seven, eight months later. So many artists started books and couldn't finish those books because they ran out of money, you know, and so it really was a, a life or death uh, struggle. Uh, but what astonishes me is just the flat out beauty. Uh, the books were beautiful and the poetry books were beautiful and the paintings were beautiful. Um, it really was a movement and that was about beauty and style because on the other side of the road you had F. Scott Fitzgerald and Gertrude Stein and Ernest Hemingway. They were all do doing their thing and they suddenly had to say, whoa, what's going on over here? Um, and, and they came to respect the artist of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, I think uh, the significance and impact continues to be huge. One of the reasons is the locale. I used to have a roommate my freshman year at Morehouse, who was from New York. His name was Peter Moody. Peter Moody always carried a wonderful leather briefcase to class every day. And people would say, because he liked you to ask him that, Peter, where are you from? He said, I'm from New York, New York, the city so great they had to name it twice. <laughs> you know? That was his byline. For an artist, there is no place greater than New York. In the jazz world, oh, you can be killing in New Orleans and in L.A. and Seattle and Chicago, no disrespect to any of those great places. Boy, but if you haven't played New York, that's something missing from your resume. And it seems to be that way for the classical musicians as well as the jazz musicians, as well as the hip hoppers. If you haven't played Madison Square and you in a band like Earth, Wind and Fire, where have you been? <laughs> New York, New York, it is something special. It's something special and I think 
One of the legacies, if I can put it like that, from the Harlem Renaissance is the geographical locus where so much of this was situated. And the fact that it was in New York and Harlem where perhaps you had the greatest black neighborhood in America with so much vitality and so much life and it brought everybody together. That's New York. Good evening. I'm Chris Borne. Just wanted to know, um, a big reason why the Harlem Renaissance happened was the great migration of African Americans from the South to the North. So these days we're seeing a reverse migration. So do you maybe see someplace like Atlanta becoming the next Harlem Renaissance? Do you ever see another Harlem Renaissance ever happening again in our lifetimes? Well, one way to respond to that it's a detail that many people uh, fail to recognize. We say Harlem Renaissance, but as far as the literary writers, many of them weren't even in Harlem. You know, we say Harlem and, and it becomes like a symbol, but some of these persons were already working in other places. I mean, some were in Washington, D.C., some were in uh, Philadelphia, but we're calling the whole thing uh, Harlem uh, Renaissance. So sometimes uh, a city a city like Harlem has taken on uh, a kind of symbolic meaning and a romanticized uh, meaning. I, I do see that happening with Atlanta too. Um, I, I think we do think of Atlanta as another Mecca and we, we have built in our minds now a, um, a certain kind of narrative about a city such as uh, Atlanta. And I think that does indeed have something to do with, at some point in time, uh, persons going, returning to places such as Atlanta. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I, this is a once in a lifetime experience. And so thank you, Susan and Kappa and Mr. James for um, hosting this this evening. Um, my background is in theater performance. And I, of course, can't get enough stories about people's experiences with the Apollo Theater and its impact um, on the community. I also would be interested in knowing if any of you, um, if there are any particular theater performances or theatrical plays or musicals that you've experienced that you've seen or haven't seen that you might like to see revived or brought back that would have impact and education on the era. Shuffle Along is, you know, is, is, is the signature Harlem Renaissance play, and it's, and it's being redone right now. Shuffle Along, uh, where you have U.B. Blake, Noble Sissel, all who grew up right around the same time as uh, Will Marion Cook and Company, and it's a fabulous piece, uh, and it's being, I think it's currently, Will, is it still on, on Broadway? Shuffle Along? I don't know. I know, I know that it, it... I think it's off now. It's closed. It's closed. Yeah. But that, you know, th those kind of works uh, started, you know, and again, you have Black Broadway. A lot of, uh, of what Broadway became actually came out of some of the early plays by uh, Will Marion Cook and, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Also, you had, you know, plays and, and works like Vaultville, Black Vaultville created a lot of the black music. Uh, the, the black musical actually helped create uh, musical theater, so all of that uh, came in and around the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And I also right. like to add that as, par as a part of our um, I Too Sing America, the Harlem Renaissance 100, um, some of the core or art organizations here um, is doing uh, replicas of some of that era of music and dance and theater. Um, and so Cat Co. Um, here in Columbus will be bringing that shuffle along. Uh, to the Columbus as part of that project. One of the amazing uh, um, uh, offshoots of the uh, Harlem Renaissance uh, is this theater. I mean, this was, it was destined for the wrecking ball. I mean, it wouldn't be here in all of its, all of its glory. And friends of mine, from all over the country will come here. Even had a friend of mine last time, Jovial, came from South Africa. 
And when they see this theater, they're knocked out. I mean, you know, it really can stand up against any theater in Kansas City or New Orleans or LA or Syracuse. It really can. And, you know, this is the smoke that floated through the decades and settled from the Harlem Renaissance. It gives a whole people a pride and a mission statement. So, uh, Suzanne, thank you for doing what you do. All right. All right. Fitting in, Dr. Ted McDaniel, Dr. Valerie Lee, Mr. Will Haygood. Community Conversations. Thank you for coming out.